Okay, so you guys voted for this overwhelmingly. Twice. However, this would probably take a while to do in one shot, so I'm splitting this into a few videos for upload consistency and also so I don't get overworked. This and the Edmontosaurus video won't be centered around drawing, but more so the logic behind my decisions. And maybe you'll learn something. So let's get started. But first, I want to talk about the concept. I'm going to be making a reconstruction of Tyrannosaurus in a failed hunting attempt against the Edmontosaurus. I want the Edmontosaurus to cause the attempt to go a full 180 and the Rex either being scared off or losing a fight. We often see Tyrannosaurus beating and killing Hadrosaurus easily and the Hadrosaurus being completely defenseless running in a futile attempt to not be a walking pile of meat. But I thought this would be a great way to subvert expectations and also show that, hey, just because an animal doesn't have spines or spikes or horns doesn't mean that it's defenseless. Now, there is one problem with the concept that I ran into during my research. Originally, I thought that Edmontosaurus nectins was quite a bit bigger than T-Rex. Well, turns out that it isn't. Most Edmontosaurus nectins were only slightly larger than the largest T-Rexes and the story and blog post that inspired this was actually not accurate and used the size of Shantungosaurus. However, the fix is pretty simple. There are a couple of very, very big Edmontosaurus individuals that we have found. And to further make the size difference obvious, I won't use a 40-foot individual like Sue or Scotty. Now let's get into the T-Rex reconstruction. I will be basing the Rex off of Stan, BHI-3033. Stan is a very complete Rex and is the most reproduced for casts in museums. It is also around 10.9 meters or roughly 35 feet long, so it isn't by any means the largest Rex. I'm gonna do this with the process shown in Mark Whitten's Paleo Art Handbook. Okay, now for the skeleton. There are a few bits of Stan missing with the arms. Originally, I wanted to reconstruct everything, including the skeletal diagram, but I ran into some issues. One being that I haven't seen a cast of Stan up close, at least in recent memory, and haven't worked with the bones personally. The actual bones aren't available because he got sold at an auction to a private collector. R.I.P. Stan, I guess. But also, it would take a long time to properly do it, and since I'm no anatomy expert, there isn't much of a point. There would have been several pitfalls that I most likely would have fallen into anyways. One of those is tooth slippage. After an animal dies, the soft tissue in the mouth decomposes and the teeth may slip out or extend farther from their sockets than in life. This is why there are depictions of Dilophosaurus and Ceratosaurus with teeth so long they go past the bottom jaw. The teeth in the maxilla would have been really long. A lot of reconstructions show it with the main part of the teeth jutting down beyond the bottom of the lower jaw. There is also the question of how the bones articulate and their range of motion, which can be difficult to glean from photos. On top of that, cartilage doesn't fossilize, which is a headache for anyone interested in prehistoric chondrichthians, but also affects where the bones connect, how they articulate, and how they move. So I decided that just to be safe, I'm going to use some good skeletals from online. Scott Hartman, who is probably the most respected skeletal artist, at least modern skeletal artist, made a diagram of Stan specifically, which is what I'll use. The reason I'm not just going to reconstruct a generic T-Rex is pretty simple. Tyrannosaurus Rex has a huge amount of individual variation. There is a robust morph and a grass cell morph. In fact, there was so much variation that in 2022, Gregory S. Paul and colleagues proposed that we should split the species into three, T. rex, T. imperator, and T. regina. This idea has since been rejected for a lack of evidence, although it isn't impossible that there are some other species of Tyrannosaurus, but all of this shows how drastically things can change with different individuals. Next, we're going to look at musculature. Now, there are very few well-done musculature diagrams that I've found that are credible, but I wanted to try my hand at it, so I did some research. There were a few problems, however. Most of the papers I found only covered the pelvic and hind limbs, the tail, the jaw, and the neck areas of this animal. There was only one paper that I found on thoracic muscles and none on anything else. There were some nice figures, and I learned a bit about how the muscles inserted and where, but there were some holes. The neck muscle paper I found neglected all of the throat area, which I guess makes sense since it was focused more on the biomechanical implications, but I digress. 
I ended up using reconstructions from Scott Hartman's Handy Dandy and Anime Guide and um, RJ Palmer's reconstruction for the Saurian game. After we add our muscle, there are some things that are more up to interpretation. The first I'm going to tackle is adipose deposits. Now fat deposits don't really leave evidence of their existence on the bones the same way muscles leave scars, so we'll have to make some inferences. Reptiles tend to store their fat in their tails and behind the head. Birds and mammals store more in the torso. If we look at modern predators, they don't really have a lot of fat like their prey does. This makes sense since predators go long stretches in between meals and their food is a lot more energy intensive to get. So the only case where, where anything like this would really matter is if the animal had recently or is in the middle of eating. This won't matter for this T-Rex because it is in the middle of a hunt, so it's probably not going to be full and may even be a bit thinner than usual depending on how long it's been since its last meal. Next, let's talk skin and integument. How much skin and how it rests can depend on a few factors. Generally, the older something is, the looser its skin will be on its body. If we look at modern reptiles, especially large lizards and crocodilians, they tend to have more wrinkles and folds than smaller reptiles like geckos. Birds don't really help because of their feather coverings. When it comes to integument, we have a few scale impressions from the T-Rex. The scales were tiny at only a couple of millimeters in diameter, so they won't need to be rendered. It's unlikely that T-Rex, or most of the theropods, had bird-like scoots on their hands and feet. These scoots are actually highly derived feathers that evolved back into scales in birds. The cranial integument is more interesting. We know that the animal would have had a keratinous boss above each eye and some dull lacrimal crests. The nasals were also covered in a very rough rugose texture, which probably also got decorated in keratin in life. The extent of the keratin is unknown, but there is a trend where the largest theropod dinosaurs, which include the largest rhinosaurids and carcharodontosaurids, are relatively undecorated compared to their smaller cousins. Caratol's 2017 paper on Displetosaurus horneri found evidence of large croc-like feature scales that would have been on the face. Most reconstructions I've seen only show these scales along the muzzle where the maxilla and premaxilla are. Also, crocs don't actually have feature scales. Their faces are covered in keratin, which cracks as the animals age to give it a scale-like appearance. A recent paper by Thomas Cullen and colleagues provided very strong evidence of extraoral tissues in Tyrannosaurus specifically. So for now, at least the lip debate, which wasn't a serious debate by this point, is answered. There is also the possibility of extensive gummy tissues inside the mouth. Varanids have huge teeth comparable to T-Rex, proportionally, but you wouldn't be able to tell without looking at the bones. Mark Witten's blog on the subject sheds a lot more light on it, so if you're interested, check that out. I'll leave the link in the description. I decided to give my Rex some thick gums, but not as drastic as monitor lizards. On the subject of feathers, we currently have no direct evidence of Tyrannosaurus and feathers. Phylogenetic bracketing shows other Tyrannosauroids like Eutyrannus and Delong have feathers, and that Tyrannosaurus may have had them as a byproduct of it being an ancestral trait in its clade. But the size of T-Rex probably prevented feathers from being beneficial, and the consensus is, is that it was almost completely scaly. The most reasonable feather argument would be that they had elephant hair-like feathers, such as in Prehistoric Planets T-Rex. I'm gonna go with no feathers because they would be too small to paint anyways. The foot morphology can also be interpreted from trace fossils we have, from what is most likely a Tyrannosaurus. They reveal that they had a fleshy pad on their foot. They also show the extent of the foot claws, which we wouldn't know for sure because of the keratin covering the bony core of the claw. When it comes to the gait of the animal, Tyrannosaurus wasn't able to run, but only the textbook definition of run, running. See, technically running is only possible if both feet are off the ground at once. Most actual depictions of T-Rex running are actually just speed walking, so this doesn't actually affect much. Finally, we come to the most speculative part of this reconstruction, the coloration. For now, it is impossible to note or even very confidently infer the coloring of T-Rex. Looking at modern analogs, which are the large predators that live in the world today, we see that they overwhelmingly favor cryptic coloration. Camouflage is essential for a predator to survive and would probably have been more evolutionarily important than any sort of fancy coloring for sexual display. The keratinous crest may have been more colorful though. I doubt that it would have had any bright yellows or reds since those environmental pigments would be hard to find in large enough quantities 
The crest probably had some form of structural color. Structural color makes up the blues, greens, and purples of the animal kingdom, while the reds and yellows that I mentioned earlier come from carotenoids, which have to be found in the environment. Melanin makes up browns, reds, yellows, and blacks. White is caused by a lack of melanin. All of these colors are very dull, and they're the only types of pigments that animals can actually make. I came up with several color palettes, and I think I'll go with this one. Something to keep in mind is that in reptiles, the younger they are, the more patterned and visually interesting they tend to be. Once they grow older, they get darker and duller. Since Stan is an adult, it'd probably be dull, but since it isn't as old as Sue or Scotty because of the size, it may have had some patterns or it may have been slightly lighter. Finally, it's time to draw. little dark brown pencil <laughs> it's so small oh my god i need a pen holder or something damn like my, my gray is also very very small it was so hard to sharpen let me see if i can sharpen it oh my god i can still sharpen it ow come on ah Close enough. And this is my black. Oh no, I'm just kidding. It's actually this one. I got a new one. Cause I would be foolish to not get a new black and white. What was I doing? Oh yeah, right. I'm <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I'm including this in the video, but whatever. It's 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 in the video now, that's cool. How have you guys been doing? <laughs>
Well, that ought to do it for today's video. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.